Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Minnesota State House Candidate Forum for District 64A and 64B. My name is Max Sanders, and I will be your moderator this evening. This evening's forum is organized by the League of Women Voters of St. Paul in partnership with the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, SPNN. Our thanks to SPNN for the use of their studio space. The League of Women Voters St. Paul conducts candidate forums to enable the voting public to hear from candidates on key issues that touch their lives so they can make informed decisions at the polls. The League is a nonpartisan organization that does not support or oppose any specific political party or candidate. The views expressed in each forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters or SPNN. Following the forums, the League of Women Voters Minnesota and our local League chapters will post the complete unedited recordings to YouTube and the League's website. Editing is authorized only for official media reporting. Excerpts or edited clips of candidate forums may not be used for partisan or other political purposes. We believe the success of our city depends on the values, knowledge, and commitment of our elected officials. Thus, it's essential for the public to better understand the views, opinions, and commitments of candidates running for elected office. This understanding better equips voters to make informed decisions according to their values and interests. We appreciate the candidates and the audience for taking the time to be with us tonight. You may have all noticed that there are cards on your chairs. Those cards are for writing down questions for the candidates to answer. Once you have a question, please hold it up and one of our volunteers will pick it up for you. Without further, further ado, let's introduce the candidates for Minnesota House District 64A and 64B. Running to represent 64A, please welcome Khalif Anger and Dan Walsh. <laughs> Running to represent 64B, please welcome Peter Donahue and Dave Pinto. <laughs> Thank you all for participating tonight. The candidates participating in today's forum have agreed to the forum rules, which are as follows. Firstly, campaign materials, including buttons, signs, literature, and clothing are not allowed in the studio, but you can find the candidate materials on the tables in the lobby. Each candidate will give a two-minute introductory statement. The candidates will have one minute to answer questions and 30 seconds for a rebuttal if necessary, with a maximum of three rebuttals total. Our timekeepers today are Hayden and Beatrice. Go ahead and raise your hands. Awesome. Let's thank our timekeepers. They will signal when you have 30 seconds remaining and when your time is up. We will accept written questions throughout the forum. Questions submitted by the audience must be applicable to all candidates, nonpartisan in nature, and must be on topics relevant to the office. Again, if you have a question, please write it on your card, hold it up, one of our volunteers will collect it. Questions that are of a personal nature, embarrassing, hostile, or unclear in intent will not be asked. Similar questions may be consolidated and are edited for clarity or brevity. Please remain as quiet as possible so that everyone may hear. Please hold your applause until the forum has ended so that the candidates will have as much time as possible to answer your questions. And then please place your cell phones on silent. Members of the media may be recording this forum for their own use. The forum is also be rec being recorded by the St. Paul Neighborhood Network for viewing by the public. We ask that members of the public do not make their own recordings or take photos of the forum in progress. With that, we're going to start with opening statements. Candidates will each have two minutes for an opening statement, and we are going to begin with Dan. Wow. Right after that right commercial after break. That. There's the opening statement. Uh, good evening. My name is Dan Walsh. Uh, I am uh, the Republican candidate for 64A. Um, the reason I am running um, in complete transparency is because no one else would. I believe it's your civic duty to raise your hand. I believe you need to participate in the process, even as we see a lot today, the process is really under attack. We see um, attempts to transform historical standards, historical understandings of the way legislation, government, judicial, executive operate. Um, so it's more important today, obviously, we've taken civics out of the schools, so it's not like we can even go to the young generation today and say, hey, here's what you should be doing if you want to what? Improve community. Because we are all in the community, right? We all share the same spaces. We all share, we still go to the same stores. We still do the same thing. Obviously, it's a very polarized environment today. Um, I have thoughts, opinions on why that is. I think there are some root causes we can look at. 
um, and better understand why we're in the situation we're in. But the basic situation is, is that, yeah, I did this in 2022, more from knowledge, have some fun, right? We've taken the fun out of everything today, right? Comedy is dead. Um, so that's why if you've paid any attention to what I'm doing, I'm not raising any money. Um, I'm just putting everything online. I'm trying to have some fun with it, a little satire, a little comedy, right? Because as I've said, and you can see it on my, on my website, um, this is the least mathematical winnable race in the United States this year. This district has been controlled by the Democrats for 60 years. 60 years. So I don't think Dan Walsh is going to potentially change it, but someone needs to raise their hand and do a rebuttal on some of the, what I call, banana things that have happened these last two years. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Kali? Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Uh, I am Kali Hur, and I am running uh, as the incumbent in, Senate, uh, in House District 64A. And first, I just want to say thank you uh, to Dan for stepping up to run. I do think that it is always really important to have people really fighting for uh, the constituents that they want to represent, and that that only happens when we have civil discourse and we're willing to have conversations and talk about differing opinions because a representative for any area represents all the people, just not some of the people. And so I just want to say thank you to Dan for running. Um, I, you know, this has been the honor of my life to have served in this seat. This is my third, uh, this is my fourth time running. <laughs> and uh, I didn't come from this sector. I actually uh, came to this country as a refugee. I, um, you know, got to be educated in this uh, great country. And my ancestors brought me here because we fought with the United States in a secret war. And um, this was our dream. And that participating in democracy is so important because we were fighting for a democracy in which um, we knew nothing about. But we knew that it was better than a country that would become communist and we would not have any rights in that country. And so I take this job and this work um, very seriously. And it has been the greatest honor of my life to do this. Um, you know, I studied very hard and spent 15 years in the private sector and realized that um, I was being called to do something greater than myself. And now that I was no longer, I was able to break the cycle of poverty in one generation for my family, that I was in a position to give back to a community that had loved me so much and had invested in me and given me the opportunities that I have today. And I hope to continue to give that back uh, to the constituents of 64A. Thank you. Thank you, Kali. Dave? So Dave Pinto, I'm um, the current representative in 64B and running for re-election. And, and for me, too, it's been uh, just a great honor for these years to get to do this role. Um, it's been especially um, exciting these past two years, and I know that we'll talk more about it, um, but, uh, but the progress that we've made um, in building a state where everyone has the opportunity to thrive, and we know uh, what great benefit comes from that. And again, I'm sure we'll get chances to talk about that. Um, for those um, who don't know me as well, um, I, uh, my wife and I have two boys who graduated from the St. Paul Public Schools, uh, the younger one pretty recently, um, and I serve as a prosecutor of um, specializing in gender violence, especially for Ramsey County, um, is my role outside the legislature. At the legislature, I've done a, a particularly a large amount of work in the public safety area, um, and also areas relating to, to children and families. And again, I'm sure that those issues will come up um, as well. Um, but I too want to reflect on the, the comment that was first made um, in this forum of the idea of folks raising their hand, because that is just so important. Um, I kind of have a concept I talk about of, of everybody in and wanting to have um, the opportunity for all of us to thrive. That's one meaning of that. But the other thing is to recognize that our democracy does require all of us to get involved. Um, we have lots of different perspectives, different backgrounds to have us share those perspectives in a civil way, um, but in a way that is robust, too, as I'm sure that it will be uh, in this forum and others as well. Um, but recognizing that in the end, we share this community, we share this country, um, and it does require each of us to dive in in various ways, certainly including running for office um, as the time, uh, as the opportunity arises. So, um, again, great chance to uh, participate in this forum and to serve in the role and look forward to the conversation tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Peter? Thank you, League of Women Voters and Max. You got it. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, in this new age of AI and deep fakes, this is the perfect example of civics and an unfiltered exchange of ideas. So I'm running to be uh, your representative, bring back some balance to the State House in Minnesota. A little bit about myself. My career ban began as a research scientist and as uh, uh, I, I, my first job was at St. Paul Children's Hospital studying viruses in newborns. I uh, moved on to biotech uh, to take more of a risk 
evidence-based approach to the world and forged partnerships to develop diagnostic tests for genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis and other targets like respiratory viruses. I'm retired. I live in Highland Park now. I have been there for five years. Uh, I have two godsons who live in Highland Park. Uh, my roots in Minnesota run deep. I, my grandparents were farmers. My brother and I still run the farm in southern Minnesota where we're focused on conservation of the land. Uh, to begin the forum, I, I really want to lay out some troubling numbers. The U.S. Census tells us that in 2023, Minnesota's median income adjusted for inflation has fell below 6% below the 2019 pre-pandemic numbers. So we're losing out uh, in the middle class. What was once a feature for Minnesota is now a bug. We've fallen to 47th for job creation and 43rd for GDP growth compared to other states. And of course, we're in a country that uh, where states are competing. In other words, it's getting tougher to live in Minnesota. Growing the state budget doesn't help. Uh, we grew it fivefold in the last 14 years. Uh, my, mo my motivation to sit here before you is to bring balance back to the state legislature. Thank you, Peter. Peter, we're gonna stick with you for this first question. Okay. It's around housing costs. Many working families identify the increasing costs of housing nationwide as a major hardship. If elected, what, if anything, would you do to address this? Well, the state has levers that it can pull to make housing affordable uh, for people who already own houses. And I would, I would say the number one thing that was promised in the last legislative session was uh, um, a significant um, uh, reduction in real estate taxes, which would really make it much more affordable. Besides that, um, new businesses have to be um, have to be cajoled into building houses that are affordable, and the state the state can do things like uh, make tax exempt uh, certain materials for for houses as long as they are first time home buyer uh, and affordable. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, thanks for the question. It's, um, as I've, um, I talked about having a focus on the welfare of kids and families, and as I've learned about that more, it just, um, I will say that the housing has increased in importance in my mind. Of, you know, if you, um, you can have all sorts of programs, but if you don't have a stable, affordable place to live, it's not going to do a lot of good. And if you have the stable, affordable place to live, a lot of other things fall into place. Um, I'm going to defer a lot to my colleague, Representative Her, for greater expertise in the issue of housing. I will say that um, a piece that it. So basically, we have a massive shortage of affordable places to live, and my understanding is that it really is a market failure. It's um, it's a it's you know it's um, hard to build to have um, homes that actually end up resulting in something that can be afforded, and so to increase what we need to do is increase the supply significantly, and there are a number of steps that we took this last session, including a billion dollars going into affordable housing. I think it's something like 100,000 units. Representative Kerr may be able to correct me on that. Um, that are needed throughout the metro and the state. Um, to, to fit the gap. So I will just say, answer the question, um, what I want to do is push a lot into on the supply side to build a lot more in all sorts of different strategies. Thank you. Uh, Dan? Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, you know, as a licensed Minnesota broker in the state of Minnesota, let me give you some anecdotal information. Currently I'm working with the city of St. Cloud, try to get six residential units on the top of two, a commercial building we have Saint Germ on St. Germain, anyone that's ever been to St. Cloud, St. Germain is their main thoroughfare, kind of their, their, their business corridor, entertainment district. And so when we talk about we want, you know, uh, want a market failure, okay, um, I'll tell you what is a failure. The rules and regulations that are bombarded upon someone that is trying to move something forward. See, okay, so that's a failure. Overregulation, um, you know, not assigning correct like, like, let's just use vacant housing, right? Vacant housing is in significant um, supply in, in the city of St. Paul, but yet Category 3s have significant reg, uh, regulations on them, so therefore they cannot get back into stock. So the housing is there, the market can adjudicate, but what happens is the third-party force is the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Khalid? 
And thank you for the question. So I, I would say that I just differ a little bit in the approach because uh, I have actually sat down with developers to really understand um, what is causing um, such um, uh, unaffordable prices and that we already have a lot of levers, whether it's um, investment from the federal government or state level, the credits that are provided in that the levers are there, but the problem is, is that we just do not have enough units. And when we talk about regulation, like we need regulations in order to have housing that uh, people can live in that uh, meet the needs of the environmental changes right now. And those regulations exist for a reason uh, in that the, actually the bulk of the cost is not regulation. It is actually material cost and the cost of labor. And so, um, you know, there are many uh, things that we can actually do in really looking at how we actually build um, affordable housing. Um, right now, if somebody is building a you know hundred unit apartment, uh, hundred unit um, building, and you know only twenty percent might be thirty percent AMI, and then another you know twenty percent might be forty percent AMI. Like there's just all of these uh, ways in which um, you know buildings are being um, constructed, and it is not taking into consideration that we're not building enough units that are affordable. And how do we look at the financing of that to make it um, doable? So. Kelly, we're going to stick with you for this next question. It's about early childhood care. Would you describe your plans for making child care, early learning more affordable for families both in your district and in Minnesota? Um, can, can you just repeat that question? Sure. The, what we would do or what we... Yeah, would you describe your plans for making, er, for making child care, early learning more affordable for families both in your district and in Minnesota? Yeah, um, so we, and, and this is where Dave Pinto is actually the expert on this, and we really rely on each other on the work that we do do, but, you know, child, uh, child care is um, unaffordable, that there's a large percentage of people's income going to uh, child care. I would say that, you know, what we did in this last biennium of a child tax credit, which is one of the largest tax credits the state has ever seen, um, should help uh, alleviate uh, families' income and the ability to invest in child care. But I would say that there is a lot of work that needs to be done, not, done, not just from having enough child care uh, providers, but being able to pay living wages for those child care providers. And I think that there has to be better incentive in helping people who want to be in this industry, want to be in this field, be able to stay in that. And that would mean we'd have to pay better wages. And how does the state step in to uh, allow that to happen? Dan. Excuse me. Dan. Well, if anyone lives in St. Paul, um, Rebecca Necker's been pounding the phone. Um, and she actually did get a hold of me about a week ago. So that was an interesting conversation because she has the early child care uh, referendum on the ballot in November. So let's just look at some facts. From 2010 to 2020, zero to five age um, children dropped 13%. Forest Lake just this morning posted 1,000 kids. Um, they're short 1,000 kids from 10 years ago, five years ago, didn't see. But uh, infidel or for infidel the fidel fertility rate is at 1617. On 2 1 is what is a run rate, sustainable society. So my question is, who are we serving? Because I know St. Paul Public Schools picks up a 1,000 of these kids. So it's, to me, it seems like the problem is becoming less and less. And again, regulation does prevent some of these people. The goal isn't living wages, right? These jobs aren't always meant to have living wages. They're sometimes built to be, meant to build skill and get your foot in the door and start going somewhere. So it's living wages is this kind of red herring that gets thrown out there. And that's not always the case. Thank you. Peter? point to make is uh, several years ago uh, the, the state lost about a hundred million dollars in child care in the child care assistance program uh, for failure to uh, monitor its program so um, really it's about clawing back money that was misspent um, the state has put major resources into underwriting child care expenses Dave well, this is an area of passion for me. I only have 60 seconds, so I'll dive in. I will say that 100 million figure is, is, is wrong. We can talk about that another time. But I really like how you said in the question, child care and early learning, is we need to recognize these are two, two sides of the same coin. We would never say that, uh, that educating our kids is like a sort of transition job or build up some skills. Um, there's nothing more important than getting kids off to a great start. And this is the opportunity to do so. And we know that the child care workforce is the workforce behind the workforce. This is, you know, we need to have affordable child care to do every other job that's out there. There's a huge squeeze in that. And this is a, an area where, um, unfortunately, the numbers do not add up in a way that for-profit K-12 um, doesn't really add up. It just doesn't, doesn't work. The numbers cannot work. Um, there needs to be public support for what is a public good. We have um, provided some support for that. Um, but I, I really appreciate the recognition of the drop in fertili fertility rates because the fact is if somebody's deciding whether to have a young kid right now, um, if they look at just the cost of childcare alone, 
it causes a lot of people to say, this is not something that I can afford, not something that can work for me at all. So we need to be addressing this for the good of our long term as well. Thank you. Dave, we're going to stick with you for this next question. It's also about education funding. The Minnesota legislature told us that education got a historic boost in state aid, $2.3 billion in 2023. Why are so many school districts claiming they have to make large spending cuts? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, well, one thing to realize, of course, is that the um, per pupil inflation adjusted growth in spending is, and where districts are at, even with historic increase, is significantly below still where it was um, in the early 2000s, much less when I was in the Minnesota Public Schools in a, like a long time ago. Um, and so if you think about um, where things uh, stand, we're, we've been kind of trying to fill in a hole to a certain extent. Um, and so as you continue to have growth in the number of, of um, uh, in the costs that go up, um, that what we're kind of doing is, is trying to catch up with this continual number that's, that's sliding along. So, um, you know, uh, what I'll say is that we have to continue supporting our districts and our schools and our kids all the way along as best that we can. Peter? So, yeah, let's talk about the um, $2.5 billion that was, uh, it was a one-time boost in the budget for, for schools in Minnesota. In spite of that new money, St. Paul's School District says it's about to go $150 million into the hole. And part of the problem here is that the legislature attached some pretty annoying uh, mandates to that money, which uh, ate up about half of it and really restricted the ability of schools at the local level to decide how to spend their money. Kali? Um, so what I would add to what um, Dave stated already is that I think we also have to remember that we were coming out of a pandemic and that a lot of what school districts were using to, to continue to uh, educate our children um, is the one-time money that was given from the federal government. And so then when you've actually grown your schools in, the, in, in trying to educate children in an environment that is unprecedented, when those funding runs out, even if we were to infuse, we infuse the uh, billions of dollars into the education system, there will be holes. And two, for the first time, the state legislature uh, pegged funding to inflation, in which we've never done before. And so I think it is really important that we are fixing decades problems of uh, fully funding schools, and that after the financial meltdown, when we didn't give any increases uh, for over a decade, it took us a really long time uh, to get ourselves back into a place in which schools were receiving the funding that they should, but they were playing catch up. And so let's not remember the history of where we came from, which is why we are in the situ situation that we are now. Dan? Yeah, I, I, you know, I hear these words, start them early, right? That was one of the ones that Rebecca wanted to repeat multiple times. And I question back to her was, well, if we've been starting them early, why are the outcomes so poor, right? We've moved down and down in terms of national recognition for education. Um, you know, I do happen to have a personal relationship in the St. Paul School District that was involved in those negotiations. And, you know, the reason I think it's certainly the number one budget item in the state of Minnesota um, is, you know, Minnesota education, right? You know, when you get these, when you run for um, like an office, you get a lot of questionnaires that come to you and it's kind of part of the fun just to read the questionnaire. Maybe you've been prompted into AI, get another opinion, but um, how they try to steer and how they try to guide and the questions that they offer up um, are not genuine, right? They're, they're hoping, one, either to get you in a gotcha, you know, get that individual to respond a certain way so they can potentially come back and use that again. But, um, you know, education should be tied to outcomes. That's what education should be tied to. Thank you. Dan, we're going to stick with you for this next question. Do me a favor, hold, raise your mic up just a little bit. Okay. Perfect. So this next question is about gun violence. Dan, we're going to start with you. Many are concerned with gun violence in our communities. What legislation, if any, would you support to meet the need for safe communities? Yeah, I think everybody should be concerned with violence. But what's the root cause? Again, let's start going to root cause. Let's not get into social, emotional, restorative, all these kind of linguistic gymnastics that have been created over the years. It goes to mental health and addiction. That's generally what is the root cause for violence. Now, yeah, is the gun an instrument? Yes, it is. We get into our cars and drive on the road every day. Your risk of being in a car, ca car accident, getting hurt in a car accident, is exponentially more 
than being involved in gun violence. And gun violence, if you ask any police officer, and Dave can probably support this, is group to group, gang related, personal. It's not normally random, okay? So it, get to the root cause. Root cause is mental health and addiction. And let's quit dancing around with the linguistic, the linguistic gymnastics trying to paint this any different than it is. It's not the instrument, it's the person. Thank you. Klee? So this is an issue that's really important for me as a gun owner. Um, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed in hearing that uh, the conversation is around um, um, language around mental gymnastics because they're in, in linguistics and that really just isn't true. I mean, the number one killer of our children is guns and that we uh, need safe storage. We had a bill uh, for safe storage that did not pass out of the legislature that would actually help prevent uh, access uh, in accidental shooting and killing of our children. That I have a, um, I'm the chief author of the reporting loss and stolen firearm, which I think is really important. It helps prevent straw purchasing. Um, those are all very common sense gun laws. And that the truth is, is that um, people who have mental uh, health issues are the ones who are the most likely to hurt themselves with a gun. And when you don't have safe storage, that is what is going to end that person's life. And so, you know, this isn't just some, uh, you know, us making up an issue. When we think about what is killing children in masses in schools, like there are very common sense gun laws that we can put into place so that people do not have access to guns that can uh, kill a large number of uh, students and um, people in communities, um, you know, with one, um, you know, with one trigger. And so I think that it is important for us uh, to remember that there are common sense gun laws that we should be putting into place to protect people. Peter, excuse me, Peter. Sure. Uh, I think we have plenty of common sense gun laws. Um, the red flag law is in existence. I have problems with that because uh, it it uh, obviates somebody's First Amendment rights uh, without their consent. Uh, secondly, um, straw straw purchases of guns is a is a big problem. Um, legal purchase of guns is not primarily the source of uh, guns used in violence in this state. So uh, there needs to be um, enhanced, there needs to be um, increased penalties for straw purchases. But I'm a, I'm a strong supporter of uh, gun rights. Dave? Um, so uh, Representative Hur was not exaggerating that gun violence has become the number one killer of kids. I think if you set infants aside, um, this is true in our country. And if you compare our country to 40 other countries around the world, this is just the research surveys done, same levels of mental health and mental illness in all those countries, the U.S. 20 times more likely to be killed by guns. So mental health issues, same thing in every, all those other countries, and yet somehow we're the country that's the outlier. Um, and so I don't know that we really can point to that. There was this allusion to, to car crashes, and I think this is exactly the model we need to be thinking about. Um, you are far less likely to die in a car crash um, now than you uh, were, would have been 50 years ago, and there was a steady decline because of steps that were taken to make cars safer. People still drive cars, right? We still own cars, we still drive cars. No problem there. But we've made the owning and driving a car safer. <laughs> And so the same thing that we need to do with guns is simply to be recognizing what can we be doing to have people be safer. So um, we did pass a uh, bill for criminal background checks on gun sales. I think 90 some percent of Minnesotans agreeing with that. And red flag laws and increasing penalties on straw purchasing and many other things as well and more to do. Thank you. Dave, we're gonna stick with you for this next question. It's about healthcare. Healthcare costs and insurance premiums in Minnesota have continued to rise since the peak of the COVID pandemic. Do you believe the state should play a role in reducing those costs? If so, what would you do as a state legislature? Yeah, thank you. I mean, um, certainly, I mean, um, the state should play a role. I think it, it's important to recognize you know, we all we all need health care uh, and in various ways, various times throughout our lives, and we have a very fragmented health uh, system. And so, the state, in fact, yes, um, needs to be stepping in, and and um, those steps have been taken. I think. Um, you'll recognize at the federal level, there's the Affordable Care Act that came under a lot of criticism. And as time has come, come there's gotten a lot of support from Republicans and Democrats, folks all around the country, recognizing we need to step in to make sure that everybody has access to health care um, and access to health insurance, that it be affordable, um, and uh, that there be those opportunities. Um, the challenge is uh, that because it's such a fragmented system, um, it does mean what we, what, what challenge is that, is that as you have cost increase in one part of the system, it, it can continue to increase in others as well. And so um, I know there's limited time, but but yes, absolutely, the state um, needs to be stepping in and looking at kind of how can we have a broader buying pool um, to put everybody moving forward together with their health care. Peter? Yes, um, well, 
the Dems would have you believe that uh, universal uh, payer, one single payer universal health care is the solution. It is not the solution. Um, I, as a Republican, believe that reinsurance is a, is a very viable uh, solution for bringing down costs for the very sick and clawing back, once again, clawing back the the mounting uh, waste, fraud, and abuse dollars, um, heading up to $100 million in Medicare, Medicare fraud. Um, you know, eventually those $100 million add up to some major money. So uh, uh, also, the Dems haven't supported nursing homes, and we're having a crisis in closing nursing homes. Dan? Um, you know, I think the one telling sign is United Health Group is doing the, suing the state of Minnesota. So when you hear the state needs to step in, guess what? The state stepped in and limited the market. And the market isn't robust. I was on a private, not private, but I was on a company plan for 30 years. I've gone out as a 1099 sole proprietor, and I've now engaged in the individual market. And by no means is it, you know, um, anywhere near what a private employer's, you know, health care will have. There isn't a lot of choice. But ask yourself, if the attitude and the, and the idea is to expand the market, then why is United Health Group suing the state of Minnesota for closing the market? Kali? So this is a really complex question that I think that just 60 seconds does not um, do justice to this. As somebody who sits on health care who sat with hospitals to look at their finances, to understand why the costs are so high, and sitting with insurance companies to understand what is happening. But I think that I can't even get into uh, answering the question the way it's positioned because I just reject the notion that we're looking at health here and just saying we can address costs. The truth is, is that we have nonprofit health care providers and we have for-profit health care providers. That's part of the problems is the insurance companies in which at the state, we don't get to regulate insurance companies. What we get to regulate are the entities that provide um, public assistance and public care. And so then when you continue to regulate those particular industries, then you're allowing an entire segment of people, of or, uh, organizations, to continue to do whatever it is that they choose to do in our state. And that's precisely why we had to put some guardrails around that. And that Minnesota has <coughs> always been a state that welcomed uh, nonprofit providers and, and under Republican rule, that was open to private entities. And that did not help our situation. And so the lawsuit has to do more with the fact that we've decided that what was not helpful should not exist anymore in our state. And I'm 100% behind that. I will continue to be behind that. But if you want to have a real conversation about this, let's have it because 60 seconds is not enough to address the complexities of what we're looking at, all the different systems that are integrated together that Thank creates you. this problem. We're going to stick with you, Khalifa, for this next question. Increased property taxes are a challenge for many families. What will you do to help keep property tax, tax increases affordable? This is a really good question because I just had this conversation with our chair of property taxes uh, earlier today. And, you know, Dave, Lissagard, and I were chatting about the fact that most people have the misperception that property taxes, that it's the state that actually collects those property taxes, and we do not. But with that being the case, it is usually your local entities and also, uh, you know, your county, your city, your townships, whoever that may be, they're the ones that levy those property taxes, school districts. Um, and so um, the state does have a lever in which it can pull, and we do. And this past year, we did provide property tax uh, relief, and it has, we actually had two bills that did that. And so there is more that we can do. Um, but again, this is also one of those um, issues that has... Uh, it intersects at local government, state government, uh, and that uh, makes it so that it is difficult at times for, uh, with uh, rising property taxes, and that this is something that we all should actually dive deeper into. And there are some specific policy ideas that we can um, provide. Uh, uh, but again, this would be something that would require a longer and deeper conversation around property taxes. Dan? Uh, yeah, let's just take a look at downtown St. Paul. And that is true. It is a county and city issue, more than it's a state issue. But I like the term levers, yeah. Um, the more levers they pull, the worse things seem to become. But let's just look at downtown St. Paul. What is going on in downtown St. Paul, right? We know that First National is at risk. We already know the, the, Catholic, or the, the athletic club is at auction. We had the Lowry situation, which was a Madison Equities building. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and defend Jim Crocker. If anyone knows the story, anyone knows who he is. You know, it wasn't maybe the, the greatest landlord ever. But I'll tell you what, I give his culpability at 20 to 25% of what's going on in St. Paul, and I give government the rest. Minim rent control, minimum wage laws, safe and sick leave, you know, these guaranteed mandates that business now have to incur is a 
major reason why St. Paul, you could shoot an arrow through St. Paul at 5 o'clock any night, and you're not going to hit anyone. You know, it is, it's a ghost town, and what is there isn't productive to the community, and business owners are up in arms. Thank you. Dave? Yeah, as, um, as uh, uh, your property taxes uh, are, of course, set at the, and I should say of course, but I think not everybody knows this, set at the city and county and school board levels. Um, what the state can do, though, is provide some state to support. The state has, a, has a, just a different taxing base than those areas do, and there are things that the state can do to provide support. So what we've done the last two years is, um, is just a series of things relating to property taxes directly so that if your property tax, for example, um, increases by, uh, by a certain percentage and by a high percentage, then the state can provide some support to keep that down so that the property increase its property tax increase is, uh, is slower. But the other thing is, is actually providing direct support to local governments, many of which um, local governments have such widely varied tax capacities, right? There are ones that are relatively poorer cities like St. Paul. There are some that have um, uh, maybe wealthy residents um, and then also a lot of businesses. And so it just really varies. So Minnesota through the decades has had a policy and a practice of, of using the state powers to kind of even those things out. We'll continue to do so. Peter? So part of the $17.5 billion that the <clears throat> state legislature blew through last, last session uh, included a one-time boost for um, uh, property tax relief. Um, that's a good idea. Uh, uh, Seventeen and a half billion is a horrible thing to waste. But uh, the the, um, the issue of property taxes is a huge one for my neighborhood, for my for my neighbors, and uh, it's driving people out. Basically, St. Paul wants to raise property taxes seven percent next year. Um, just a one-time boost from the state does not solve the problem. Really, the state government has to get a control on its expenses. It, it just can't keep spending like this. Peter, we're going to stick with you for this next question. Okay. What are your views on gender-affirming care for minors? Uh, I'm totally opposed to it occurring without parental consent, period. Dave? Well, I'm, uh, this makes me think about the broader steps that we've taken to make sure that people can live as their full authentic selves. Um, and, uh, and I'm really glad that, um, that uh, we have, that we've kind of taken steps. I guess it was we had the, the uh, uh, ban on conversion therapy for minors. Um, and a series of steps um, there. So I absolutely um, uh, want to make sure that we have young people um, in consultation with their families, with their parents, with their providers, but to make sure that they can make the decision that is actually right for themselves. We know that all around the country, um, there's, there are families and kids that are, in fact, um, being blocked from being able to do that in consultation with their families, in consultation with their medical providers. And thank goodness that that is not what Minnesota is doing and that we're an oasis of, um, of protection and care for young people. Kali. So I think that the positioning of this question is actually quite challenging because when we all think about gender-affirming care for children, there's a perception in people's mind of what they think that is. And if you've ever been friends with a trans fam family that has a trans child, you would know that gender-affirming care is not taking hormones at a very young age or changing somebody's sex or whatever is the case. And I think that that is the problem with how we position these questions and the things that we are saying around what it is that creates, um, that perpetuates uh, a narrative that just is not true. The gender affirming care, and I have a really good friend of mine who has a trans daughter who's only seven years old, and what that gender affirming care is literally giving, being able to have access to, uh, to medical care that allows that child that mental health support that they need. Like this child's not even on hormones yet, you know, it's in the, the, uh, the uh, spectrum of care for the child is really to ensure that that child gets to live in their body in a way that uh, best honors who they are. So I think that I, that we should be really careful about how we ask these questions and how we talk about these issues because we're either perpetuating the notion of what we think gender affirming care for children is or that we're actually going to provide truthful information about what it is that families are accessing. Dan? Yeah, reassignment surgery does happen. Puberty block blockers do happen. What percentage? Good luck getting the accurate data and, and finding out. But you know what? Paper came out in April, UK, right? Because the argument always was, hey, we have to provide this care, otherwise they're going to commit suicide. This is the first really in-depth research study that's ever been conducted. If you ask anyone in the, in the field and say, give me a study, give me some research on 
hey, does this re you know, transition surgery, chemical castration, does this actually prevent or, or induce? Guess what it induces based upon the study in the UK. It's a, it's a zero tolerance, no go zone. Europe, the Nordics, they all do counseling up until you're 18. When you turn 18, if you so feel, because we've stated in our country that that's the adult age, go for it. But finding it from parents, keeping it from parents, having counselors, you know, push and steer, because that happens. Maybe it doesn't happen at a significant amount, but it's a zero tolerance thing. It should never happen. They are not at the point to make those decisions. End of story. Thank you. Tim, can I, can I would you like a rebuttal? Yeah. Okay, you have 30 seconds. I do just want to state that I think it is really important for us to understand. I, I wish that people who are taking an opposing position to this have a conversation with a family who actually has a trans child. Understand what that family is going through and then make your own judgment, but don't make a blanket statement about what is happening to our trans children. I think that is very harmful and it continues to damage our trans community. I think it's really important for us to think about that before we speak and put narratives out there. Dan, you requested a 30 second rebuttal. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, let's have the conversation. Guess what, we don't have the conversation because it becomes this, it becomes an emotionally you know, um, charged, non-empirical base. I just said, there's a study that was that was developed for over many years in the UK in April. Give me another study. Give me research, right? I'll talk to any family. I'll talk to anyone at any time. But the data isn't supporting these surgeries. In fact, common sense should tell us, hey, let's just kick it down the road because when they become mature mentally, then they can then make a better decision. Thank you. Dan, we're going to stick with you for this next question. What more or different actions should the state be doing to address mental health issues, especially related to homelessness? Well, you know, it, <clears throat> talk about complex issue, and it's not a one-factor solution. Um, first, it starts with getting them into situations where, you know, care can be provided. Um, that's not always easy because the individuals don't want to go. So how do you force someone against their own will? You know, that's not an easy thing to do. But, um, you know, when you figure it out, or if someone does have to crack the code, let me know because we've been working on it for a long time, people, you know? And I think one thing is just quit with the pandering laws, let's get them in the facilities. Remember Totem Town? Close Totem Town, let all the juveniles out. I don't know if Ramsey County sold it or not, but how about that as a facility? How about repurposing some buildings and starting like some ideas there instead of, well, anyway, I think it's too complex to solve with one factor solution or you know a two minute answer. But um, we haven't succeeded, no one has succeeded. You know what? And so it's got to be incremental steps to try to figure out how to better serve these people when honestly sometimes they don't want to be served. And that's a very difficult challenge. Thank you. Kali? I'm sorry, can you just repeat the question for me real quick? Sure can. What more or different actions should the state be doing to address mental health issues, especially related to homelessness? I think that we can always um, to have greater investment in mental health support. And the truth is, is that in our state, and I think this is true in many states, is that mental health support is actually the lowest reimbursement um, uh, piece of health care that anybody can access. And so that we are not having enough of our institution provide mental health support, whether it is for uh, pediatric and, and juvenile um, emergency crisis care for them, or whether it's for uh, adult uh, insert, um, uh, not just outpatient, but being able to have uh, beds for people who are uh, experiencing crisis. And so, you know, if we really want to do something about it, then we need to invest meaningfully into it. We need to increase reimbursement rates for that. We need to also invest into culturally competent uh, care for healthcare providers who provide mental health services uh, that have actually a cultural lens that they can look from because we all experience mental health differently depending on uh, our experiences and who we are as people. And so, um, those are just a couple of the solutions, and I would have to say that in order for us to continue to collect data, uh, whether it is for trans procedures or whether it is for what our homeless uh, population is experiencing, that you're going to have to grow government in order to do that. It doesn't come for free. Peter? Yeah, our health care providers do a pretty good job of offering mental health care, uh, mental health services. Um, I'm not worried so much about that. Um, really, the big issue is the is the link up, the link up of of drug addiction and mental health. And, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, there should be facilities in the, in, uh, scattered out, out and about in Minnesota where people who are truly c 
committed to uh, dealing with their drug and mental health issues can be um, can live on a campus where students are learning how to deal with the problem and learning how to treat these uh, the people with the problems. Dave. Yes, yeah, so I guess I I would disagree that the system that our mental health care system is kind of on par with our physical health care system. In fact, I think there's sort of historically there's been such a major gap between them, and that's, I think, a, uh, at the root of a lot of the problems that we're having now. Uh, we really do need to build an actual mental health system that actually supports um, people with, with, that kind of, with that kind of health challenge. Um, the, your question, uh, uh, and I agree with the points that, um, that uh, Kali made, um, the committee that I oversee, um, that I chair, oversees homelessness, among other issues. Um, and um, we've taken a lot of action in, in that area, recognizing that, yeah, that mental health, that, that um, for some people, uh, what's going on and experiencing homelessness um, isn't about mental health issues, it's about um, challenges that they have, um, you know, working a job and you know, being able to afford a home. Um, and we want to make sure we provide shelter there. But for some people, it is, in fact, mental health challenges. And in fact, as was said by Peter, this chemical dependency challenges as well. So um, this is extremely complicated um, set of issues, um, but we have to start with providing the care that people need, providing stability and shelter, and then helping folks to build their lives. Thank you. Klee, we're going to go to you first for this next question. When the state has a budget surplus, what should the legislature do with that money? Spend it on programs and services, return it to the taxpayers, or a third option? Um, did you say that the last option was a third option? Is or if, if either of those options is insufficient. Either, um, um, I think that there's many things that can be done. I mean, I think it's not, it's not an all or nothing that if you have a surplus, you do one thing. I think that we can always look at the balance. I mean, when we looked at... Um, you know, some of the ways in which we were uh, addressing Social Security or whether we were giving money to um, school districts or whether we were, you know, we were looking at all different ways in which some people did receive, uh, depending on, um, you know, the, the, the legislation that we passed, received our money back and some people received investments in their industry. And then, um, and so I think that it is, an, you can't look at one thing and say, this is how we'll spend it. I think it is really important to look at uh, all the levers that you have and what you would do with the surplus. And I am really proud of the things that we did. We did invest in Minnesotans. And, you know, our speaker said it the best today when we were at an event tonight, and that I think that a lot of times individuals talk about how we wasted the surplus. And the truth is, is we didn't waste the surplus. We invested it. We just decided to invest it in children and families and had our friends across the aisle been the ones that they would have spent all that money too. They just would have given it to uh, people other than who we decided we would give it to this time. Dave? Yeah, I think it's um, it's challenging to think about this without without context. I guess my response about kind of how a surplus would be spent in general is maybe to look at how this particular surplus, how the decision was made. Um, because what we did is to look and say, what are the needs of the state? Hopefully, that's what the that's what um, uh, we do. Um, that's what we as a society do, right? Is say like, what are our needs and what are the resources and how do we meet the needs with the resources. Um, we looked at, um, at very, in various areas at our transportation system. We talked about housing earlier. Um, we talked about education and early current learning and a wide variety of areas and saying, what are the needs in those areas? What are the resources available? Um, we, along the way, um, we had the largest tax cut in Minnesota history, um, in addition to those other things as well, and saying, um, what, are, what can we do in each of these places and what is the best way to allocate the funds that we have Whatever they are. When I say we have, I mean the whole budget and thinking about that. So that's the, that's the approach that we took in the past, um, this past biennium, and I guess I would urge that a similar approach if another surplus were to come along. Peter? Funny thing happened on the way to spending all that $17.5 billion. They broke a few promises, the Democrats did. They promised to rebate a significant amount of that, $2,000 to taxpayers. Never happened. They promised uh, uh, Social Security, making Social Security tax-free, uh, tax never happened. Um, it's, not, it's not the state's money. It is the Minnesota citizens' money, and it should, be, it should have been mostly rebated. Um, I, will, I will just add that on top of broken promises, at the same time, they spent $733 million on a new office building. Now, that's a pretty bad look. Dan? You know, I'm always reminded of what Milton Freeman said about surpluses. It just means the government didn't have enough time to spend it. 
and uh, you know uh, he was kind of right on with that but you know when we talk about meeting the, the constituent needs you know we know overwhelmingly the constituents wanted that surplus to go to tax cuts we just heard there were tax cuts but yet we see on the balance sheet an explosion an explosion of over 40 percent of the operation the opex right guess what you have to maintain that opex now going forward so that run rate that you just put on the books now has to be accounted for. How are you going to account for it, right? The only way the state generally raises money, they have some ancillary revenue generators, but is to take. They take from you. It's your money, right? So um, that surplus could have absolutely been better used. You know, the, the main challenge right now with the state of Minnesota is they need to balance their checkbook. You know, I, I go to these questionnaires, well, how, what makes you feel you're, you're qualified to run for office? And I just, you know what I put every time on every questionnaire? because I can balance my checkbook. Thank you. Can I use my rebuttal? Sure. <laughs> I don't know how many we get, but I haven't done before. Three. Um, I, oh, we get three. Oh, really? I didn't even know that. Okay. Um, oh, wow. You don't um, have to use them all. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, well, now that I know. Um, I just wanted to point out, just in terms of the long, long run, just to recognize that, um, that the budget that we passed included, um, I believe we're at historic level of, of um, rainy day fund. So absolutely rainy day funds, so if things go south, um, a, a healthy balance there. It includes uh, the forecast of, um, I think at the time when it passed, was actually expecting that there would be a recession. Um, the, the point is the budget that we passed absolutely included long-term planning and taking that into account. As it turns out, we've actually had a continued surplus ever since we passed that budget, but absolutely taking into account long-term plans. Thanks. Can I use uh, 30 seconds? Yeah, we'll go to Peter, then Dan. Okay. Oh, sorry, I thought you yep. were quoting No, go ahead, Peter. You got 30 seconds. Okay. So uh, uh, we have, we have a, a real problem here because uh, there's a forecast of a couple billion or a couple billion dollar uh, uh, deficit coming up in two years. Uh, the spending, the, 40, the, uh, the $10 billion tax increase on top of uh, uh, the unfunded mandates or the, the ongoing baseline uh, uh, budget increases that Dan was talking about are going to put us in some financial trouble in a couple of years. So I don't know what Dave is talking about um, uh, keeping us on the even keel. We are keeling over. Dan? Yeah, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of um, uh, Warren Buffett's how to read financial statements and interpret, you know, um, financial information, right? So I don't know what balance sheet he's looking at, what income statement what cash flow analysis, right? The economists on both sides have already said, here comes the deficit. It's already forecasted. It's already there. So again, I would love to see, maybe he can post it to his website tomorrow or the next day, whenever he has time, not an immediate need because the damage has already been done. But let's see the income balance sheet and cash flow analysis. Thank you. Kui? would just say that uh, all of that data is public data. You can access it. And as a person who is an undergraduate in finance and I have an MBA, I do know how to balance uh, my checkbook. I probably didn't need all that in order to do that. But I do really just want to point out that as the pension chair, we were very responsible about how it is that we spent money and that I wasn't able to give any increases uh, that had structural changes to the pension plan because I'm responsible and I'm fiscally conservative when it comes to uh, looking at that. And so we were actually extremely uh, responsible in the budget that we put forward and how our spending happened. Um, I want to also just uh, clarify for the uh, for uh, the audience to understand that um, we would never say that a corporation who's growing their business and their expenses year over year because they have to increase pay for their employees, we would never say to them, you're just growing your business for and you're just wasting money. When you run an entity like a state and there are people who make the majority of your costs, there is going to be cost increases because people need to continue to have cost of living adjustments as well. So you cannot you. ask the same things of, corporate, uh, of uh, nonprofit entities and government if that you're not asking of corporations to do. We're going we're gonna to move on. Uh, Peter, we're going to start with you on this next question, which is about abortion. Given, it's about abortion. Abortion? Okay. Yep. Uh, given the U.S. Supreme Court Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade, state legislatures are enacting new laws regarding women's reproductive health issues, including access to care and birth control. What measures, if any, do you think the Minnesota legislature should enact regarding women's reproductive health and abortion? Sure. So abortion is a very divisive and uh, personally troubling issue. The, um, the state, the 
the Democratic controlled legislature has has really gone over the top in opening up the um, uh, taking off all the guardrails for abortion in the state. Um, I'm not I'm not uh, adamantly pro-life, but I believe that um, there has to be some guardrails on abortions up up to uh, up to and including birth. Dave. Well, people should be able to make um, the health decisions that are right for themselves in consultation with their um, physician, with their clergy, whatever works for them, and that includes reproductive health decisions. Um, and I'm really proud of the steps we've taken to treat abortion care um, and reproductive health care more generally um, with that in mind. Um, and that's really the work that we, that we did um, in this area this session is to say, um, uh, rather than having this be something where the dot, where uh, the government is going to decide for people what happens with their bodies, we're going to let people decide for themselves what happens with their bodies, consistent as we do in other areas of healthcare at all. It, it's uh, just to say it's not the case of of you know removing guardrails in some way that are not present for other kinds of health procedures. It's treated as a health procedure where people get to make the decision for themselves in consultation with the people that they want to consult with, and not have the government tell them what to do with their lives. Dan. Well, you know, it's rich, right? You know, we went through a pandemic where we didn't have my body, my choice. You know, I worked for Major League Baseball during that time. February of 2021, guess what came in? Or 2022, guess what? Vax mandate. I mean, I didn't do any conscientious objection. I didn't try to say, you know, my religious rights are being violated. <laughs> They're violating a lot of religious rights in today's world. So, you know, divisive issue is an understatement. It is their number one platform. Um, that they run on year and year and again. So, you know, my question to them is, I mean, we, we're, we're, we're the most extreme of any state in the union. Why is it even on the ballot? Why are we even talking about it? Because all I read is it's been codified. When you codified something, you etch it into steel, right? So that means it's immobile. It's not moving. But yet every, this is two years ago, abortion. Here we are again. Guess what? I can name 15 things before that that are probably a little bit more pressing because you've opened up the floodgates, you've allowed anything at any time, right? So why are we even talking about it? It's not on the ballot. Thank you. Kali? What I think is rich is a bunch of men telling us that this is not a pressing issue. This is a pressing issue. It has always been my body. It has always been my choice. And the truth is, is that when we say we've codified something, it means we codified it into law. We did not codify it into our institution. I would take it one step further. And as the chief author of the ERA, I would say it's codified into our constitution because if we want to have equal rights, we want to have equal access to, and we want to be able to uh, look at um, uh, equity under the law, then we actually should have same protections under the law. And that what we codified was to ensure that what rights women had before uh, Roe was overturned is that we were able to keep that in place for us here in Minnesota. And so I think that we need to talk about this very factually. And remember, this was never a divisive issue until recent times. So Republicans used to lead the work on uh, equal rights. Republicans used to be the ones. We actually had pro-life or pro-choice Republicans until the 2000s. We actually had pro-life Democrats until very recently. This is a recent phenomenon. They're making this a uh, polarizing issue. It is the people of this time that has done that because it didn't always used to be a partisan issue. Can I, uh, can I ask about sure. Go ahead. You have 30 seconds. a question? Kaylee, so you say that this shouldn't, uh, this shouldn't be so polarizing. And then you, at, you began by saying Men have no voice in this conversation. We're, we're just going to refrain from personal statements. So do you have a, an additional viewpoint you want to add? Okay. Well, I guess I would say that um, um, then to rephrase what I, my statement is, men certainly do have a voice in this conversation. Uh, and, and to suggest that they should be excluded is polarizing in and of itself. Kali, go ahead. To be really clear that it's because the candidate next to me said that there are other pressing issues and that uh, the way he positioned it was my response was to say that it is actually my choice. It is our choice. And that for men to sit up here and decide they're going to make decisions for women's bodies, you do not get to make that, which means I should also get to make decisions on whether you get a vasectomy or not. I should get to make decisions on whether you should have access to Viagra or not. I should be able to have decisions over males' reproductive rights if you want to have the same thing over female and people with uteruses' reproductive rights. Do you want, to, do you want yeah, your final rebuttal? to respond, right? So again, uh, what don't they have today that they need to get further rights on? You can go to the ninth month, right? You, can, you, you have every availability. You have every opportunity. It's becoming a cottage industry in Minnesota. They're coming from other states now. They're running here. 
They're like, absolutely, let's go. So I don't know why we're, again, you know, is it a divisive issue? For sure it is, because of this reason, right? And um, it's used as a campaign, I don't know what would be, closure? That's not the right word, but anyway, I think you get my point. Uh, thank you. Use mine. <laughs> Which is just to point out that in half the states in this country, this is illegal. The government is right now deciding this. And there are people dying as a result of this. And people in horrible situations. I have a, I have a friend who's an OBGYN in Texas. And she has had just the, just the most awful story. She does not um, uh, do abortion care herself. She does not provide abortion care herself. It's not something that she wants to do. But she's told me horrible stories about trying to provide care to her pregnant patients where because of that Texas law, it's putting her patients in extreme jeopardy, extremely dangerous. So this is a real thing right now, today. Kali, we're going to stick with you, Kali, for the next question. It's about climate change. According to the Pew Research Center, younger generations are increasingly concerned about climate change. What do you believe the state should be doing to address climate change and broader environmental issues? How would you act on these beliefs if elected to the state house? So I think that... Uh, um in our trifecta, we actually did a really great job. We passed clean energy by 2040. We have done quite a bit of work around protecting our environment and our water system. We've done uh, work around um, you know, energy incentives and alternative energies that we actually did quite a bit. I actually was the chief author of a bill that brought uh, $100 million in, um, uh, into um, uh, to alternative fuels and using waste in order to turn that into fuel. I also was the chief author of the microgrid research and really looking at how do we create microgrids. And St. Thomas here is one of the institution uh, of just two institutions in the country that actually have microgrid research and that we continue to invest in this. It is really important for us to continue to look at all of the options in which we can have cleaner water, cleaner air, cleaner soil so that we can have the kind of future. But it is urgent. It is urgent. And if we stop having... Uh, roadblocks from uh, individuals who either, either are climate deniers or individuals who do not want us to explore alternative uh, energy and resources, that if we didn't have that opposition, we could get to a solution that and will actually make true change sooner and faster. Dan? Yeah, when I talk about linguistic gymnastics, right, you talk about climate denier. You know, I've looked at the models. I've, you know, I like Bjorn Lundberg's attitude and approach on this, all the above. Right when it makes sense, when it's scalable, um, you know, in in the carbon conversation, which is the 2040 100% carbon uh, neutral, you know, that's not the issue. You know, I think there's almost starting to be consensus. But the challenge again with this whole conversation again is, you know, that they're they're not allowing open and honest ideas to go back and forth because modeling the climate and let's just be real clear and honest. The climate has been changing forever. We do samples in Antarctica. We do samples all over the place. We know for a fact it has changed multiple times during the course of the history of the planet. George Carlin has got great bits on this. Google him, you to him, where he's like, you're going to change the climate. You're going to control the climate. And that's the type of stuff we're talking about, right? Thank you. Peter? Sorry? Oh, you're up. Okay, uh, I realize that uh, there's, there's scant time to talk, so I'm going to focus on one thing, and that's the 2040 plan that, the, again, the Democrat uh, legislature has come up with, and our governor, Waltz, has, um, has uh, touted. The 2040 plan is a myth, or is a, is a fantasy. Um, the idea that we are going to be 100% carbon-free by 2040 is... It's unaffordable and unattainable. We need to rely on fossil fuels for at least uh, the while, the short while. But really, the key is nuclear power. And my old buddy Mike, sitting there, has uh, helped us solve that problem some 10, 15 years ago. Really, uh, um, intermittent power sources like wind and solar are just that intermittent, and our grid isn't built to handle that. So uh, phasing out nuclear power plants is a bad, or the power plant is a bad idea, and we have to continue relying on fossil fuels. Dave? I appreciate Glee talking about the work that we did the past two years. I guess I want to step back and just have us all like recognize, you know, that the science doesn't care whether we believe it or not. Like, it's just, I mean, 
Um, we, it's funny, you've got two Democrats here, both at MBAs. I, I have one as well. When I was in business school in the late 1990s, I participated in a program that, um, that kind of was looking at projections for, for temperature and rising at that point, you have predictions of this. And guess what? It's risen just as was predicted late 1990s. So there's just sort of like random temperature fluctuations. I don't know how they would have known that back then. You talk to farmers, you talk to folks who work in the land, they see like this is a real thing. And I feel like what we hear um, is all sorts of different versions of either, well, this isn't really real, or it's hard to really be able to tell, or it will be so much work in order to actually address it. So the generations to follow us, every single person in this room, <laughs> they are going to be really, really angry and be in really rough shape because of action that we did not take now. So we can figure, we need to figure it out, but I think it needs to start with us acknowledging this is a real thing that we have to actually take action on. And we've got lots and lots of different excuses. We need to take action now. So we have time for two more questions before closing statements. Dave, we're gonna stick with you for this next one. What policies will you pursue to make Minnesota an attractive place to live, work, and raise a family, particularly for young adults? Boy, great question. Um, there's that twist at the end about young adults. I, first, I'll just say, I mean, I, I do feel like this has been a theme for this past two years in, uh, in, the, in our last term, this past term in office, is to make sure that Minnesota is, in fact, a great place to live and work for everybody. Um, and I will say that thinking especially about people who are beginning their working lives and thinking about starting families, um, our state, just to, just to make sure we recognize this, we've been on a path for a number of decades where we've tended to invest more, to tax more, we've sort of acknowledged that, have a state that's had much um, better economic growth and um, has been better um, fiscally and financially. People have made a lot of really good money and individuals too have become quite wealthy in our state. Great, good for them. And we've also had a happy, healthy um, populace as well. We've gotten that right through the years. I will point out we've we've um, been missing that for one part of our population, um, in particular a lot of our a lot of our Minnesotans of color. So in the past two years, we've tried to address that much more to build on the work we've done before and to close some of those gaps. Make sure all Minnesotans can participate. We will continue doing that in this next two years. Peter, yes. Um, We have uh, we have problem with um, we have a problem in the state with with affordable uh, wages. Uh, as I pointed out at the beginning, our real uh, median income has has dropped six percent since uh, the pre pre pandemic time. Uh, really, it's it's the job of government to uh, spur innovation and to get out of the way and let businesses. Uh, uh, do their thing, make products that people want to buy, which results in higher wages, which is the, the major problem that I, I run into with uh, the millennials that I talk to in my neighborhood. And that is the state, uh, the state is, is increasingly taking more of their money uh, and they're feeling much more financially fragile. Otherwise, hey, we got a great quality of life here. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I take this issue actually really seriously because as somebody who, after I graduated college, had many options to go to other states to take other jobs, I chose to come to Minnesota. And I want that to continue to be our tradition. And we can talk up, up here and maybe laugh about what we think is happening in the state of Minnesota, but the truth is, is that we have made it much more attractive for younger people. That in pensions, that I actually had, uh, so, uh, that we passed a bill that said that if you are a young person paying your student loan, that you can't put money into your retirement plan, that the payments that you make towards your student loan now counts so that your employer can match you if they match up the 2% or 4% that that payment you're making, actually then they get to put that money into your retirement account. That's really attractive for young people. That for first time homeowners, uh, that we're providing down payment assistance if you're a first time uh, homeowner. That we are also investing in our parks and our trails and the environment and that I sit on the legacy committee and we continue to fund that through uh, the legacy funds in order for us to have an environment in which we uh, can live in and we can enjoy uh, our parks and our trails and our uh, forests. That, that is really important for quality of life. And I will also say that we've been talking about education and how can we sit here and dare say that uh, all this money we're putting into education. Education is what draws young families into the state of Minnesota. And so there are many, many ways in which we are making our state better. And the truth is, is that making uh, um, minimum wage, $15 minimum wage, earn sick and save time, pay Thank family you. leave, all of those things bring young people into this state. Thank you. Dan? Yeah, if we're going to talk about debt, I mean, are we going to subsidize the journeyman electrician, the journeyman plumber? You know, are we going to start subsidizing those individuals? Because I tell you what, they're the backbone. Remember when Obama said you didn't build this? I right? guess what Obama didn't build anything. 
Northern Minnesota built it, the taconite, the steel, the miners, right? That's who built America, okay? So when we talk about disenfranchises of the young, well, I mean, they're not starting families, they're not buying homes. Why is that? Partly due to education, right? If we go back to the African dance studies, you know, that they took in college, the one point whatever or two point trillion in debt because the government decided to get involved in subsidizing loans in 1969, 1996 or four, when Clinton, you know, just blew it up in terms of the federal government supporting student loans. This, again, is another example of the reason we're in this student debt issue is because a lot of the government put them in that position and people guided them to degrees that aren't going to provide a standard wage of living. Skills. Skills. Thank you. All right, Dan, you're going to go first on our last question. Minnesota continues to have some of the nation's highest economic and social disparities between its white residents and residents of color. What do you believe should be the state's role in addressing racial disparities? You know, it goes to accountability and responsibilities. There's an individual by the name of Roland Fryer. Check him out. He was an economist at Harvard. Uh, the irony is he got canceled by Claudine Gay um, for a study he uh, conducted in uh, summer of 2020 on uh, police force in the city of Houston because it showed that deadly force is no different between black or white. So he also did an incubator thing within the Bronx. So uh, what he was able to do is not discount that we all come from different places because that's the line, right? Evidence-based education, social emotional learning, we all come from different, different places. He didn't give them the excuse to continue forward on that. And guess who Roland Fryer is? Check him out. Look him up. Really, really credentialed economist who happens to be black and the way he wants to deal with young, you know, we should be talking about other groups, but Indians and Asians are the two most upwardly groups in the United States to get today. Why is that? Because they came in with some of the same hardships. They came in with some of the same obstacles. Why? Culture is a big reason. Thank you. Dave? Well, as I alluded to before, this is really the, I mean, we've had this, this wonderful thing in our state for multiple decades of having, being both fiscally and financially successful and then also successful when it comes to quality of life, et cetera. The big gap is what you've alluded to. Um, and uh, we need to recognize that it was government policies um, that led to a lot of that gap um, and that it's gonna be government policies are gonna be helping along the way with that as well. Um, my particular focus has been on, and we alluded to it before, is child care and early learning and making sure that the youngest Minnesotans do get off to a great start. We had a, there was a comment earlier about, about um, starting early and that's not something that we have been doing. The fact is we have not been. And those early years really make a difference. And those are um, some of the uh, greatest um, uh, percentages of Minnesotans of color, our youngest Minnesotans, and those continue to be some big gaps. Um, so I'm proud of a lot of the things we've done this past two years. I guess what I'll say in the closing seconds is that this has been a major focus of ours and that lifting up all Minnesotans and Minnesotans of color does lift up all other Minnesotans as well, that we actually all benefit when we do that. Peter? Peter? Uh, yeah, our test scores are declining and it's a, it's a, worrisome, it's a worrisome event. They, they started declining before the pandemic and of course then they slid greatly. This, the test scores um, are heavily, uh, the, the problem with test scores is that, they're, uh, that people of color in Minnesota are the ones that aren't performed, are, are falling behind. Um, I couldn't agree more with Dan's uh, description of the uh, Roland Fryer Academy in the Bronx. I highly recommend looking it up. It is an educational miracle and we could transport that to Minnesota and that is public private partnerships that just demand excellence from students, be they minority, be they people who don't think that they can, uh, that they can achieve in this, uh, in this world. Um, but the fact is, our scores are not increasing and success and failure in this world is so dependent on, on effective learning. Kali oh, excuse me, Kali? Thank you, and I think as um, the only person of color up here, uh, I really can speak to this experience of what it was. Um, and I, I would just want to provide some context to some of the um, arguments that were made up here around why uh, South Indians and, and Asians are doing well. And the truth is, is that as a uh, doctoral student studying uh, and doing my dissertation on this particular topic, is that Asian women actually have to have more education and more experience to make the same 
uh, have the same income as a white man would. And so like I have to incur more debt, I have to incur more experience in order for me to make the same amount of money. I don't think that's anything to do with culture or values is that I don't think, I would love to not incur that amount of debt and have to work twice as hard in order to make the same amount of money. I would say that uh, it's really important for us to remember that the reason why disparities are so large is because our white population is doing exceptionally well, better than the um, average white uh, communities in uh, other states, but our uh, uh, BIPOC communities are doing worse, worse than in other states. Why is that happening? It's happening because of our legacy of, of, of uh, and boy, this is going to be really tough to end here, but I think it's just that we have to think about the history of our state and why it is that we created these disparities and why it is the government had to step in and look at maternal health disparities and the data that is from that. Um, and so Thank we have you. to continue to do that work in order to identify those disparities so that we can work on them. We're going to move to our closing statement portion to remind everyone candidates have two minutes for a closing statement. We're going to go in the opposite order of opening statements, which means, Peter, your time starts now. This is what I can promise you if you elect me to represent you in the state legislature. I will not vote to increase your tax in our state budget. I will not vote to increase taxes. Peter, move the microphone. We'll, oh, reset, we'll reset this time. You're fine. We'll start again, but just, yeah, talk about okay. the microphone. I will not vote to increase our state, our state budget. I will not vote to increase taxes or fees. The state has to learn how to be leaner and meaner. I will bring a focus to encouraging business growth leading to better paying jobs. My dedication will be to make uh, uh, waste, fraud, and abuse uh, a focus. Uh, I'm totally dedicated to the Office of uh, Legislative Audits. Uh, on day one, I'll put out a fraud, uh, fraud watch from the House newsletter. So here's the big picture, and this is quick. Government doesn't actually make anything. Uh, the only way a state gets wealthier is if they make stuff that people want to buy. Government should exist to encourage businesses to innovate, to make more stuff that people want to buy, which leads to higher wages, which leads to better employment. And Minnesota is really slipping in this regard. So uh, we are in a competition with 49 other states and we aren't winning it. If I can leave you with one thought, it's this. State revenues are not a bottomless pit. Um, yeah, I won't editorialize on that anymore. We gotta prioritize. Uh, we can't have everything. Last, last session we saw a Christmas tree of spending where everything was chosen. And we saw some important broken promises made to the taxpayers. Uh, I want to make this, I want to make life better for my uh, nephews and godsons, i.e. the next generation in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Dave? Um, thanks for this conversation for the past, however long it's been, I guess, hour and, a, hour and 20. Um, and because uh, I actually do feel like we've had some nice opportunities to, to recognize um, some difference in philosophies and approaches. Um, the fact is that the successful state we have now, which includes, um, which included the surplus that was that was generated heading into the last budget session, et cetera, is because of the investments and the approaches that were made in past years. We have a we have a state that has had tremendous success through the decades because there have been foresight. Uh, people with, with great foresight to say, hey, we need to make sure that we're investing in our people. That's been a payoff in Minnesota. When we do that, yeah, it does cost money up front to do that, and it pays off. And because they did that decades ago, we have been reaping the benefits. I'm so proud for the past two years that that's the approach that we have been taking is the same thing. It's a multi-generational, intergenerational thing. We say, look, as we build a state now that is better prepared for the future, that will have a payoff. It's a state that is welcoming and inclusive through so many different policies, a state that allows everybody to contribute and to thrive and to be their best. And that is actually something that, we, um, that we've taken that approach. I'm so proud to do that, and I am excited for the chance to continue to do that in the coming two years as well, um, and excited by the opportunity to, to kind of share this vision with the people of 64B and hope that they will uh, decide to send me back to do some more. Thanks so much. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Dave. Kali? Thank you, Matt, and thank you for the discussion tonight. Um, I would say that maybe I, I see government very differently because I came from a country in which government didn't take care of its people. It didn't take care of its environment. But the country in which I was born in, the town village that I was born in, is underwater because the river was dammed in order to make uh, energy, to make electricity for China. 
that the wood that my fam that our culture uses that is sacred in our burials no longer exists because we've uh, tim taken all the timber down. I don't want to go back to a country like that. I don't want my country, America, to become a country like that. And I don't believe that government doesn't make anything. Government makes something. Government makes the environment in which people will either thrive or they will flounder. Government is what is going to control whether you have clean drinking water or you do not. Government is going to, con uh, is going to decide how we're going to get rid of PFAS so that everybody doesn't get cancer from the forever chemicals that are in our water. Government is going to decide that when you pick up the phone and you need an emergency vehicle to come to your house, that that EMS uh, ambulance shows up to take, you, uh, to take you to the hospital. That is government's role. Is does, did it create the infrastructure and the environment that allows you to live the life that you should live? And if you do not think that government is actually making something, then I, I just don't know what you think government is there to do to provide all of these services. And so I am committed to continuing to ensure that the people of this state, that the people in 64A, get to live the lives that they want to, whether it is they get to choose for their own bodies or what happens to their trans child or whether it is that they get the health care access that they need, that I will continue to always center those things because it matters. Government makes something. It makes the environment you all live in every single day. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Kali. Dan? Uh, yeah, there's definitely a conflict of visions. For those of you who know Thomas Sowell, read his book, Conflict of Visions. And you'll see, yeah, there is a different lens that goes from one group to another group. But, you know, I, tried, I decided to end uh, with Saul Alinsky, right? People know Saul Alinsky. I decided to end with him. How to create a socialist state. Control health care and you control the people. Number two, poverty. Increase the poverty level as high as possible. Poor people are easy to control. Debt. Increase the debt as high as possible as this will increase poverty. Gun control, remove their gun, they have no protection. Welfare, take control of their lives, food, housing, income. Education, take control of what people read and listen to take control of what children learn in school. Common core, see Mao on that one. Religion, remove the belief in God from the government and schools. Class warfare. Divide the people into wealthy and poor. This will cause more discontent, and it will be easier. Take from the wealthy with the support of the poor. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to thank all of our candidates and the audience for attending tonight's forum. I want to let you know of three upcoming events. Tomorrow, September 18th at 7 o'clock. At this very location, we're going to have a Ramsey County Board of Commissioners District 3 candidate forum, so come to that. If you're able to, if not, you can view it online. September 20th, Friday, is early voting, and then November 5th is the general election. So to learn more information about these events, other events, lwvsp.org. Again, my name is Max Sanders. Have a good night. Oh, I got this cramp. Oh, God, okay. Ah. The good thing is that...